if the estimations are right and if the cycle is true and here's a little bit of information scientifically speaking about the upcoming solar max and how it can be felt upon our planet but we'll go through some highlighting it can tail it entails different things there's a saying up here plasma physics, solar activity, atmospheric chemistry, fluid dynamics, energetic particle physics, and even terrestrial history to understand it. No single researcher has the full range of knowledge. They've assembled dozens of experts from many fields working together. This is the summary of their combined efforts to frame the problem of uh, of the sun and it's ramping up of the cycle and how it would affect the earth. He points out that while the variations in luminosity over the 11 year cycle amount to only a tenth of a percent of the sun's total output, such a small fraction is still important. Typical short term variations of 0.1% in incident irradiance exceed all other energy sources. Particular importance is the sun's UV, EUV, ultra, extreme ultraviolet radiation, and it peaks during the years around the solar maximum, which would be this year if they turn out to be correct. With a relatively narrow band of EUV wavelengths, the sun's output varies not by a minuscule 0.1%, but by a whopping factor of 10 or more, affecting the chemistry and structure of the upper atmosphere. And they discussed how the changes in the upper atmosphere trickle down to the Earth's surface. Top-down pathways for the Sun's influence. And uh, Charles Jackman of the Goddard Space Flight Center is describing how the nitrogen oxide created by solar energetic particles and cosmic rays in the stratosphere can affect and reduce the ozone layer by a few percent and because ozone absorbs UV radiation less ozone means that more UV rays from the Sun would reach the Earth's surface that's not good for you and me and Isaac Held took it one step further how the loss of ozone in the stratosphere could alter the dynamics of the atmosphere below it. The cooling of the polar stratosphere with the loss of the ozone increases the horizontal temperature gradient near the tropopause. This alters the flux of angular momentum by mid-latitude eddies. Angular momentum is important because the angular momentum budget of the troposphere controls the surface westerlies. In other words, solar activity felt in the upper atmosphere can, through a complicated series of influences, push surface storm tracks off course. Many of the mechanisms proposed at the workshop had a Ruby Goldberg like quality. Mm hmm. Gerald Meal, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, presented persuasive evidence that solar variability is leaving an imprint on climate, especially in the Pacific. According to the report, when they look at the sea surface temperature during sunspot peak years, the tropical Pacific shows a pronounced La Nina-like pattern, with a cooling of almost one degree Celsius in the equatorial eastern Pacific. In addition, there are signs of enhanced precipitation in the Pacific the SPCZ, as well as an above normal sea level pressure in the mid-latitude north and south Pacific, which peaks in sunspot cycle. The solar cycle signals are so strong in the Pacific that him and his colleagues begun to wonder if something in the Pacific climate system is acting to amplify them. And uh, one of the mysteries regarding the, their climate system is how a relatively small fluctuation of 11 year solar cycle can produce the magnitude of, of the observed climate signals in the tropical Pacific. 
and they use supercomputer modeling showing that not only top down but bottom up mechanisms amplify solar forcing on the surface of the Pacific. In recent years they considered it's possible that the sun plays a role in global warming. Yes, it has a role, obviously. After all, the sun is the main source of heat for the planet. But the report suggests, however, that the influence of solar variability is more regional than global. And the Pacific is only one example. When Earth's radiative balance is altered, as in the case of a change in solar cycle forcing, not all locations are equally affected. The equatorial central Pacific is generally cooler. The runoff from the rivers in Peru, Peru is reduced. Drier conditions affect the western USA. And we had a nice drought here in the Midwest, and I believe we're still technically termed quite a few places in drought. Uh, Bradley of Massachusetts studied the records, historical records of solar activity imprinted by radioisotopes in tree rings and ice cores. And he's claiming that the uh, rainfall seems to be more affected than the temperature. If there's a solar effect on the climate, he thinks, it is manifested by changes in general circulation rather than in a direct temperature signal. And this fits in conclusion with the IPCC and previous NRC reports that the variability is not to cause a global warming over the last 50 years. Well, I beg to have a difference of opinion on that. <clears throat> it plays a role. We've got a lot of nuclear testing that was done trapped in the atmosphere. Much has been made of the probable connection between the monitor's minimum of 70 year deficit of sunspots in the late 17, 18th century and the coldest parts of the Little Ice Age. The mechanism for that regional cooling could have been a drop in the sun's UV output, but that's speculative. The Scripps Institute of Oceanography pointed out the value of looking at sun like stars somewhere else in the Milky Way to determine the frequency of similar grand minima. In the early estimates in solar type stars ranging from 10 to 30 percent implying the sun's influence could be overpowering. More recent studies using data from Hipparchus, which is a European Space Agency astronomy satellite, and properly accounting for the metallicity of the stars plus the estimate in the range of less than 3 percent not a big number, but seemingly significant. The sun could be on the threshold of a mini Maunder event right now. They're claiming that solar cycle 24 is the weakest in more than 50 years. Moreover, there is, which is controversial, evidence of a long term weakening trend in the magnetic field strength of sunspots. They predict that by the time solar cycle 25 arrives, magnetic fields will be so weak that few if any sunspots will be formed. If the sun really is entering an unfamiliar phase of the solar cycle, then we must redouble our efforts to understand the climate sun link. Concluding discussion, the panel said a number of possible steps foremost was the deployment of a radiometric imager device is currently used to measure the total solar irradiance reduce the entire sun to a single number. The total luminosity summed over all the latitudes, longitudes, and wavelengths. This integrated value becomes a solitary point in a time series tracking the sun's output. This Peter Foucault pointed out the situation is more complex. It's not a featureless ball, the sun, of uniform luminosity. Instead, it's dotted by dark cores of sunspots splashed with bright mag magnetic froth known as faculae. Radiometric imaging would essentially map the surface and reveal the contributions of each to the sun's luminosity. 
particular interest are the faculae. While dark sunspots tend to vanish during solar minima, bright faculae do not. This may be why paleoclimate records of sun-sensitive isotope C14 and BE10 show a faint 11-year cycle at work even during the Maunder minimum. Some of them that attended, they stressed the need to put sun climate data in standard formats and make them widely available for multidisciplinary study. Very complicated. You've got to have many guys from many fields work together to model them and compare their results. Now, Maring of NASA headquarters has studied the report. And he's saying lots of possibilities suggested. A uh, few, if any, have been quantified to the point we can definitively assess their impact on the climate. No, it's not ready to go over a cliff and say anything. Finally, many participated in no difficulty in deciphering the sun climate link from paleoclimate records as tree rings and ice cores. And here is your. Got a link right here, the full report. And we just had an article here not long ago about how we were the supposedly the hottest year on record in 2012. Well, I can say 2011 was pretty hot too. It may not have been as hot as 2012, but it was certainly very warm. Well, we're not in spring and summer yet. But when they start hitting, we're going to see if they're right, if they're wrong, if whatever. There'll be not much we can do about the sun, you know. It is what it is, and it will be what it will be. And somehow we just have to deal with it. If it does ramp up, we already discussed it could affect the power system. The crops that grow, the food we eat, how much there is to buy, the cost of it, because it may be lessening the yield, and you know, animals got to have water. Animals need to stay relatively cool so they don't die. Well, among other things, in 2013, the sun, the big disk in the sky, keeps us all alive. We're going to have to hope that they're all wrong and that we don't have a, a you know, a bunch of CMEs and stuff. So, trust in the Lord. Get closer to Him. He listens to all your prayers. When you pray, don't doubt that you won't receive it. Don't put any time date and be looking for it by a certain time. But believe that you received it. You may even forget that you prayed for something. But if it's His will and you really believe, He wants to grant it to you. Pray for the people of the world, the hungry, the sick, the homeless everybody in every situation because they all need the help and God's the only one that can give it to them so I'll talk to you all soon God bless every one of you